Uh, I served there for 15 years. I never knew this exi that existed. <laughs> really, never, never happened. And so I remember the first year I came here, and they go, Pastor David, it's Appreciation Month. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Are you pranking me or something? And then, and then you guys like just totally showered us with such love, and I, 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 I never knew how broken I was. <laughs> I was like, oh, is this what it's like to be loved? Um, anyways, yeah, no, seriously, it is all. It's like big time all. Like my, my wife is like, oh my gosh, like this is such a wonderful church. I do love you guys. Um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead into our, our passage. It, turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, verse 29 through 39. Um, just, just out of curiosity, my wife and I, we typically have a Thanksgiving feast that we've always uh, would have for singles in particular who didn't have family, uh, especially back in D.C., which was such a transient area that a lot of people were students or just young professionals, their families weren't there, and so we'd have you know, anywhere between a dozen to maybe even uh, two dozen people at our home. Um, is if is there anyone here who does not have family, doesn't have a place to go at Thanksgiving this year? Okay, one, two, anyone? Seriously, I I, I know this seems kind of odd. I'm not trying to call you out. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to invite you. Uh, okay, so at least two, three. Okay, well you know it's funny because I didn't really talk it over with my wife. Uh, <laughs> So the ball's on your court, babe. Uh, what should we do? There's like three people here. They have nowhere to go. All right. There it is. You're invited, you're invited, and you're invited. Okay? And then, again, if there's anyone here who doesn't have a place to go, my information is on the website. You can talk to any of our staff, and you get my contact information. Please call me. Please contact me. We would love to have you at our house. My wife makes a great non-dry turkey. All right. So I'm going to turn to 15, chapter 15, verses 29, 39. Uh, if you have it, say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Jesus went off from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them. So that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. 32. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I'm unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over. Those who ate were 4,000 men, besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your gentle leading today. And we pray that our hearts be filled with more of you. Lord, lead us into your word. Speak through me. And I pray that you would also bless the brothers and sisters and friends here with the gift of listening to, that you allow their hearts just be shaped and molded by the word of God. We thank you. We bless you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, you know, last week we began by noting how difficult certain passages can be, right? Like Jesus seemingly had a harsh response to that Canaanite woman with that sick child. But as it turned out, Jesus, what he does is he commends the mother's faith. And then in doing so, he also heals the little girl who was oppressed by a demon. And the woman, the Canaanite woman, she knew who she was. She's like, I get it. I'm not one of your people. I get it. I'm undeserving. I'm nothing. I'm on the outside. I get it. But more importantly, knowing who I am, I know who you are, Jesus. You're the Messiah. You're the hope. You're the Savior. You're salvation. And I got no one else to turn to. Right? So she knew who God was. She knew who Jesus was. Now, in our text today, it may seem strange that we read this passage here because right now you're scratching your head saying, is this deja vu? 
was going on. Wait, Jesus feeding 4,000 people? I mean, didn't he just feed 5,000 people in the last chapter? Does this mean that this is a duplicate story? <gasps> Does that mean that the Bible has errors? Does that mean the Bible is fallible and the Word of God is inconsistent? That means I have no idea where I'm placing my faith and I'm no longer Christian? Are you guys thinking that? No, okay, you, well, you guys have faith, all right? Well, the idea is this. God, he uses these similar stories, and these aren't errors, but these are similar stories, yes, that we've heard from before, but God uses them so that he can really bring in the point. And he's got a point for us, something that we need to get. So there's a couple truths for us, okay? Here's my first one. Jesus invites to himself the nobodies of the world. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a nobody. Isn't that so contrary to what the world says? The world says, look in the mirror and say, you're somebody. Well, here we're saying I'm nobody. Now, did Jesus feed 5,000 or 4,000? The answer is both. These are two separate incidents, and I know what you're thinking. You're saying, I don't know. I don't know if that's entirely true. Well, I'll tell you some evidence, okay? Earlier, it was 5,000, and this time it was 4,000. Also, the number of loaves were, was different because Jesus before had five loaves to work with, and this time he had seven. And then also, the amount of leftovers was different too. Before, it was how many baskets? Twelve. Now this time, there are seven baskets. Shall I go on? I will. The length of time of the day was different too. First time, the, the first hungry crowd that were with Jesus and Jesus fed them, they were with him for how many days? One day. This time, the hungry crowd of 4,000, they were with him for three days. Three days. But the most significant difference between these two stories were the people. The people. Because the 5,000 in the first feeding, they were the Jews. This time, the 4,000 that are being fed were Gentiles. And how do we know that? Because it says in verse 31 here, and they glorified the God of Israel. You see, that phrase was a common Old Testament phrase that was often made by non-Jews, a.k.a. Gentiles, whenever they would refer to Yahweh as in the God of Israel. But if that's not enough for you, in the Gospel of Mark, man, it makes it super clear too. Mark says explicitly, this travel, this journey of Jesus went down from Tyre where he met that woman, that Canaanite woman. And then he went northward through the city of Sidon. And then without coming back down to Galilee, Jesus traveled eastward and then down southward into the east of Galilee area. And this is significant because this entire area that Jesus now finds himself to be, this is an area called the Decapolis. And the Decapolis is a word for ten cities. And this ten cities was an area that was settled by the Greeks. By the Greeks. And in that whole area, completely distinct from Jerusalem or for his area, this place had its own currency. They had their own civil law. They had their own army and its own people. There may have been some Jews that lived there, but the main majority of the inhabitants of this entire area were primarily Greek. That means they were Gentiles. That means they were enemies of God. That means they were non-Jews. And this is significant for us to understand, especially as a reader, is that Jesus stepped out of his comfort zone, he left his home, he left his people, and he performed this great and mighty miracle to a bunch of Gentiles. He showed himself, he, he revealed who he was to a bunch of people who are not his own. The Gentiles, in that place, to those people. And this is interesting because the writer of Matthew, Matthew, he was writing to a specific audience, the Jewish audience. And he was writing this after the time of Jesus' resurrection. And so during this time, something great was happening. Something great was happening in that the gospel was being advanced into this unbelieving Gentile world. And so since Matthew was presenting this gospel to his audience, which were the Jews, he was presenting to them as this, hey, Jesus is your king. He's your Savior. And he's not just your Savior, but he's the Savior of all. He's the true promised Messiah. And guess what? As much as you have a covenant with him now, he is opening up his covenant to God's people 
all around. That means he's reaching not just into Jerusalem, not just into Judea, and not just into Samaria, but now into the ends of the earth. He's saying, this is for all. This is good news. It's not just for you guys. It's for everyone else. In fact, he's saying it's not just for that one Gentile Canaanite woman who's seeking the crumbs from the children's table. But now we have this passage here where Jesus feeds 4,000 Gentile people with the children's food. This is amazing. What was Jesus doing? Man, he was bringing a bunch of nobodies into God's covenant. So what's the application here? God, he promised to Abraham to bless the whole world, and that was happening. But then the first world century Jewish church, they had a problem. Their problem was a, was a difficulty in accepting Gentiles into that church. Um, do you recall Peter's vision of when the, of when the what was it called, the uh, sheet full of unclean animals were being lowered down to him? And then he hears a voice, and it says, Rise up, Peter, kill and eat. And what is Peter's response? He's like, no way. I never eaten anything unclean. Now, you have to remember, this wasn't about food. It wasn't about God saying, hey, pork is really good. It wasn't about that. Instead, what, Lord, what God was preparing Peter for was to preach and share the gospel to this unbelieving Gentile who was a centurion named Cornelius. He's prepping him for that, saying, hey, my message of hope and salvation is not just to people like you, Peter, but to that guy too. So get ready. Don't call what I say clean is unclean. And even when Apostle Paul went out into the Gentile world, and man, he was successful in terms of evangelizing because people are hurting, they're broken, they're lost, they're dark, and, God, and Paul was just sharing the light of Christ to them. And so there were successful evangelism uh, uh, trips, and, and there were successful church plants going on. But not long after that, you see this great council of church leaders, they all gathered and convened in Jerusalem, and then they were just scratching their heads saying, you know what, I know what Paul's doing, and I know what God is doing out there, but let's really kind of think back again whether or not we should accept these Gentiles into our church family. Like, man, it was such an issue for them. It was such a problem. God was doing powerful, amazing things, and then like these folks are saying, yeah, but do I really want them with us? Like, do I really want to bring them into my fold? into my home, into my church, into my spiritual family. I mean, let's be honest. The world has a hard time accepting those they don't know, those from a different race, those from a different culture, different background, in their, even into their lives, I and mean, yes, even into the covenant of God. Now, here's a quick test for you all, okay? Um, who would you feel more comfortable befriending or approaching? Would you feel more comfortable approaching someone who looked like you and who maybe lived where you live? Maybe if you had kids, had the same age kids, maybe similar season in life, someone who had the similar socioeconomic background as you, would you feel more compelled and comfortable to approach someone like that? Or would you be willing to approach someone who looked different than you, someone who didn't live in your zip code? someone who didn't have your type of education background, someone whose culture maybe seemed completely opposite of yours. And the reality is this. We all tend to gravitate towards people who look like us, don't we? We do. That's just a fact, it seems. And the thing is, we might get a little defensive here right now, saying, no, Pastor, you have no idea who I am. I am missional. Yeah, we might be missional to those who may not look like us, but let me ask you this. Are you relational with them? We might say, that's an objective. I see that person who doesn't look like me, who doesn't have, make the type of money I make, who lives in a different area, drives a, a worse car than me, or whatever the situation might be, now I'm going to see them as someone I pity, someone I see as a cause. So I'm going to go ahead and share the love of Christ. Oh, yeah. But would you be relational with them? Would you actually befriend them? Would you actually love them? Would you actually invite them to break bread with I don't know. You know, the history of Global Harvest Church, it all began, and I shared this before, but not this part here. The history of Global Harvest Church started really with Pastor Tommy, who I had the pleasure of eating with 
um, back when I first began here. And there in that meal time, he shared with me his story of how it all came to be. And he also shared with me his vision that he had for the church, which before was called the First Korean Baptist Church. And his vision was really unique, especially back in, I think, was it the 70s or 80s maybe? 70s. 70s. This is unique. Is that he really wanted to bolster up the next-gen ministry, in particular, the English ministry. That is the EM or the EC, depending on where you're from, English congregation, right? There's an EM. A lot of Asian American churches, specifically Korean American churches, have something called the EM. And his vision was this, that he really wanted to bless them. And he really wanted them to flourish and to grow. And so what he would do is something that most churches would never do. He gave them a better service time slot. <gasps> Can you believe that? Do you know how sacred that is? Like, seriously. You know, for 15 years at my EM, you know when our worship time was? Two o'clock. Two o'clock. Now, all the people on Saturday who were hungover, they loved that time. Right? But everyone else is like, this is really late, Pastor David. I'm like, I got no choice because this is what we got to do. So he gave them the best time slot, and he poured resources into them, and he invested in them and did all that stuff. And it's extraordinary because a lot of Korean churches, and I won't just bash Korean churches, but a lot of churches that have an EM, man, EMs tend to be like a secondary ministry, if anything, maybe even just an afterthought. But no. He's like, these are people who are not second-rate citizens within our church. I love them. I want to pour into them. I want to invest in them. And so this idea back in the 70s was completely revolutionary. In fact, even churches today still struggle with that. But as great as that was with Pastor Tommy, think about Jesus for a second. Here he is. He's like, I want to bring the church. And when that, what I mean by church, I want to bring hope, and I want to bring salvation, and I want to bring restoration, and I want to reclaim people to the promises of God. I want to do that. And I'm not going to just do that to my lost sheep of Israel, but to those who other people would never think twice about. To those who people say, you, I, it's not that I just don't even like you. It's that I hate you because you're my enemy. Yeah, those people, I want to bring them in. Like, this is shocking. The Gentiles and the foreigners and the so supposedly unclean and the nobodies of the world. Jesus is like, yes, I am for you. Folks, it's easy to get wrapped up where we are in life, where we only kind of want to reach out to those who are like us. But I tell you, and the passage tells us quite clearly, that's not what we're called to do. Do not stay in your little comfort zone of saying, I'm only going to relate to someone who looks just like me, or someone who's in that same stage in life. No. You know, our discipleship and evangelism model, I had to test the first service, and they failed miserably. Okay, what is our evangelism and, and uh, our, our phrase for the evangelism discipleship model? Okay, okay that's not fair. You're my wife. <laughs> okay, who's your one? So I guess I'll never know. Anyway, so who's your one? And it's not who's your Asian American one, right? It's not who's your fellow professional colleague one. It's not your fellow who's your neighbor who drives the same uh, car and has the same zip code and all that stuff one. No. It's not who's your upper class middle one. No, it's who needs to know God one. Who needs to know Jesus? And I'll tell you, that person is probably right in front of you. Whenever you go to work, whenever you're maybe even at home, maybe in your neighborhood as you take your trash out, that person's right in front of you, in front of you but what we do is we look right past through them. Meanwhile, God is saying, hey, I'm sending you to share the gospel to them. Here's my second point. Jesus loves broken people. Now, I'm from the East Coast, and uh, I've been to New York maybe half a dozen times in my entire life. I've never been to the Statue of Liberty, Okay. I know you guys aren't shocked because you don't care either. <laughs> I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. I've never been to the Empire State Building. I've never done any of those touristy things, although I have to say my wife and I are having a conversation. We're like, I'd like to do that now. I don't know why. We want to do that now, but anyways, I've never done any of that stuff. Every time I go, because every time I go, I am too busy eating. <laughs> but something interesting on the Statue of Liberty, it says this. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to, be, to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift 
my lamp beside the golden door. The idea is this, that we as a nation, as America, we strive to do good, that we are striving to be accommodating and to be a refuge for those who are perhaps persecuted, who are oppressed, those who are hurting, those who are looking for a better and brighter American dream type of future to help the unfortunate. And the reality is this, as much as we try to do stuff for people all around and within too, our nation will always, at the end of the day, be lacking. We'll always be lacking. And we'll always also be unable to make good on these promises. Now, our text today tells us that Jesus is different. Jesus isn't just some bronze statue of the liberty saying these kind of broken promises or failed promises, but Jesus, he makes good on his promises. Why? Because Jesus genuinely loves broken people. Like genuinely loves broken people. And we really need to get that because I think we are a lot of people who genuinely avoid broken people, wouldn't you say? We say, we say that. We say, stay away from her. Stay away from him. He's got issues. She's got drama. They have emotional baggage. Don't get involved in their lives. Stay away and all that stuff. They've got too many issues and all that stuff. They are an inconvenience, and man, they will drag you down. They will drag you down. I remember, in fact, when I was in youth group, this one guest speaker came, and it was a, it was a powerful sermon, but this one thing just really kind of stuck with me. He, he got up on a, on a chair, and then he asked me, actually, uh, he called me out, and he said, hey, David, okay, I want you to stand on top of the chair. And so I stood on it, and he was on the ground. And he goes, let's hold hands. So I'm holding his hand, right, like this, or rather, I'm like this. And then he goes, he goes, uh, David, I want you to uh, pull me up. And the guy was maybe a, a buck 75, whatever. And I'm like, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't do it, right? And he goes, all right. And I really couldn't budge him at all. And then he just looks at the crowd, and he goes, ladies and gentlemen, look at how easy this is. And he just yanks me down, right? I almost like busting my teeth. Um, this is back in youth group when there were no rules. <laughs> but the idea is this, is that it's like, yeah, it's so much easier to bring someone down than bring someone up. I, I get that concept, but th what stuck with me is this, is that you have to completely avoid difficult people. Uh, complete, because they're bad people, but you're one of the good ones. And good ones should stay with good. In fact, Benjamin Franklin has famously quoted, said this, he who lieth with dogs stand upeth with fleas. Yeah. We, there's Proverbs kind of about that, giving you general wisdom and concern about that. But the reality is this. Who's not broken? Who's not hurting in our lives? Who doesn't have some sort of drama or some sort of past or some sort of history or check it, whatever? We all have it, and yet we keep trying to remove ourselves from that. Meanwhile, Jesus immerses himself into that and says, I genuinely love you. Where are we on that? Man, I pray that if that's not you, if you feel like you have a hard time bringing yourself into the lives of others, that God, you would pray today, God, would you soften my heart? I'm not saying it's easy. It's difficult. It's a challenge for me too. But would you pray, God, would you soften my heart and love people the way you love them? But God, also, would you help me love people the way I know you love me? So we see this love first when the lame and the blind and the crippled and the mute are brought to Jesus. In verse 30, it kind of paints this interesting picture. Because where it says here that broken people were laid or put at uh, Jesus' feet. Now this word laid or being put at Jesus' feet, it literally means this to throw, or to throw away, or to throw off, or to cast to the ground. Now, I don't think people are literally just chucking their people at the feet of Jesus and violently just like saying, hey, heal him, or anything like that. But more so, what this word and what this phrase kind of means is that there was a deep sense of weariness and desperation from the loved ones who were bringing their sick ones to Jesus. Imagine, if you will, a dad who's holding his son, who's hurting, if not even dying, and then rushes, gets in the car, weaves through traffic, and then gets, parks his car, leaves the door open, rushes into the ER, holding his child in desperation and in frantic, just feeling he just throws, looking for a doctor, throws his son, his dying son, 
in the arms of that doctor saying, heal him. That's kind of what this, what this image evokes. Now, these family members, thousands of them are coming, and they're casting their hurting loved ones at the feet of Jesus, knowing that there's no one else to turn to. Jesus, heal him, trusting that he would heal them. And what happened? Jesus is good on his promises. He heals them. Again, Jesus demonstrates, hey, I'm not like one of those charlatans who say they can do cool stuff and heal you and lead you. No, I'm the real deal. I'm not fake. What I say is what I do. And so he heals them through this powerful, mighty act of healing so many. Folks, people will come to you in desperation throughout your life. They will. But the question is, will you receive them? I know it's tiring. I know it's taxing. But will you receive them? And will you love them too? Will you listen to them? Will you provide what you can for them? Brothers and sisters, will you pray for them? But we see his love again when the people got hungry. Now, they may have brought their own food, but remember, they weren't with Jesus for just one day. They were with him for three days. So that means all the Lunchables are gone, right? Food's done. But Jesus, having compassion on them, said this, I am unwilling to send them away hungry. Now, that word send away, it's been used several times in recent verses, but it's better translated to the word dismiss. So back in chapter 14, the disciples, if you recall, told Jesus, dismiss the hungry crowd. But Jesus didn't do that. He fed them first. Then last week in verse 23, the disciples told Jesus to dismiss that Canaanite woman. She is a nuisance. But no, Jesus only dismissed her after she professed faith, and then he healed her daughter. Our problem is this, is that we tend to dismiss people before meeting their needs. Whether it's maybe something as basic as hunger or maybe a conversation that they want or maybe even a prayer that they need. But before even diagnosing the issue, before lending them our ears, we often dismiss them because people are more of an inconvenience to us. Folks, I want you guys to know life is about God, but it's also about people. It's also about people, our investment that we do in our lives. Some of you guys are investing all sorts of things, some in cryptocurrency, in stock market, and buying real estate, in your education, and trying to uh, climb the corporate ladder. We're all investing in this because we all want a better future for ourselves. But I want to ask you, do we invest in people? Do we invest in people that they might have a different eternity? Do we, in fact, invest in people that maybe investing in them might even give them a better today. You know, Jesus, he was full of compassion, and his spirit indwells in every believer. And those of you who are wrestling with that, don't suppress it by ignoring those around you who need to talk, or those who need prayer, or those who are confused and reactive and broken and angry. I mean, I can barely handle my two kids when they're hangry. I can't imagine Jesus dealing with 4,000 hangry people. And yet, instead of saying, get out. Don't you know how tired I am? Don't you know how fatigued? Don't you know the, the drains and pains of ministry and what I've been doing? Don't you realize just a couple days prior to all this, I've already healed tens of thousands of people, and now you're calling me, and you're asking for me, and you're doing this? No, he never once dismisses them, but in compassion, he goes, I got to feed them because I don't want them to faint. I want to feed them. He has compassion. So Jesus, he actually feeds these people. Now, his disciples, they say something really silly. They say this, where are we? Are you guys laughing? I was reading, I was laughing. I was like, oh, these disciples. Where are we to get enough bread in this desolate place? Seems like a dumb question. I mean, didn't they remember Jesus just feeding 5,000 people recently? Now, there's a few theories, okay? I want to share them with you. Some people have said, because it's so weird that they would ask this immediately, some people have said maybe this wasn't the same group of disciples who were with Jesus during the first event. Because at this time, there was a lot of followers too. Maybe they kind of rotate or I don't know all that stuff. So maybe it wasn't the same group, and so this group didn't know what happened during the first event. 
Another theory, some also have said that it's possible that the disciples, they did know that Jesus could do this, but they were kind of asking this question and phrasing it in kind of this anticipatory manner, almost like with a sense of sarcasm and hope, like, wow, look at this group, Jesus. What shall we ever do? Finally, the last theory is that the disciples, while knowing what Jesus could do and that he also had fed not only 5,000, but remember, maybe 10 to 15,000 Jewish people not too long ago. They go, yeah, I know he can do, but certainly you did that because we're your people. You would never do that to this group. They're the Gentiles. Send them away. Like, where would we get food? It's impossible. Now, personally, I reject all three of those. And this is my conclusion reasoning. I just simply believe that disciples were dumb. I do. Um, I believe that they have always shown a history of short-term memory. I believe that they've always shown a history of not having deep faith. Uh, that they were simply too foolish and too forgetful and unbelieving that Jesus could do this again. But more than forgetting... I think we often seem unconcerned about practical things like hunger and basic needs that people have. In fact, the Lord, he warns us against responding to people with empty words when people have real needs. It's like when you see a homeless person, you go, oh, you must be hungry. God bless you. No, buy them a meal. They have real needs. Again, I want you all to take time to join in on signing up for that Thanksgiving uh, meal share Invite the refugee family, invite one or two or maybe three UTD international students uh, to your lovely homes for Thanksgiving. Bless them by sharing the gospel. Bless them by filling their bellies with food too because people are a lot more receptive when they're full, aren't they? You know, I wonder if you really care about the broken people though. And I'm not just talking about the obvious ones, like the homeless ones or the ones who are out panhandling or doing all that stuff. I'm talking about the ones in your community. And you're like, oh, there's no broken people. Are you kidding me? There are broken people everywhere in your community. Here's, here's, a, here's a real shocker. Okay, are you guys ready for this? There's broken people in your family. Real hurting people in your family. And if you're married, I'll say this. You know what? Maybe your spouse is broken. And here's the other thing. Maybe you're broken. And we all are. We have all these people in our areas, in our families, in our neighbors, community, our church, our own family members, our friends. How are, we re- how are we really caring for them? We can be less exclusive and start by inviting them into our lives. Share a meal with them. Share a meal with them. Ask them how you can pray for them and actually pray with them in that moment. If they're hurting, listen to their pain. Let them tell you their story. It's not always about having this ability. A lot of people go, I can't find myself to do that because there's no resolution, and I want to be able to help them. No, it's not about the ability to fix or heal them, but it's more about your availability. Your availability, because giving people your precious time is often much more appreciated and valued. But like Jesus, he didn't just talk to people. He met their needs. And this is a challenging thought for us today. Jesus says in Matthew, on the day of judgment, he says this. Some will hear him say, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying this, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. Folks, never underestimate how important it is to see the people who don't look like you are not in your same type of life or stage as still image bearers of God. They are God's creation, and the Lord loves them. And God, Jesus, genuinely loves the broken, the hurting, and the outcast. 
But maybe, maybe right now, you're the broken one. Because, let's be real, maybe you think, man, you're sitting down here right now this Sunday morning, and you're burdened. You are. You think you're such a burden to your family, that they would dump you at first opportunity. Or maybe you've been so dismissed so many times by so many people that you assume, no one cares about me. Like, no one cares. If I fell off the face of this earth, no one would text me. No one would call me. No one would know. If I died in my apartment, no one would know. My body would just be rotting. No one would know. Or maybe you just feel so burdened because you've been lectured and preached at and counseled and and maybe even ridiculed, but no one truly listens to how your real struggles are. No one truly knows how you feel. The point is this, guys, guys. Your soul is hungry, but you've given up hope because you failed too many times and you're you're broken in too many ways and you've squandered too many opportunities and you firmly believe that somehow because of your track record that there is no chance for you and it is impossible for you to change. If anything, I just said here, if it rings true, then yes, you are broken and yes, that means then I am broken too. And while we aim to love and be compassionate towards others, we'll fail, and we all have failed. But hear me when I say this. The Lord says to you this. If that's you, if you're broken, and you feel just so in disarray right now in your life, Christ our Lord says this. A broken and contrite heart I will not despise. Because you're broken, and because you're feeling such pain, he won't dismiss you. He won't hate you for that. He'll bring you in, and he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The world cannot do this, but Christ can, and he does. Others may dismiss you, but Jesus never will. He loves the broken, and he loves people like you, and he loves people like me. And how did he show his great love? By laying down his life on the cross to atone for our sins. He did it all. We have no claim to anything but simply admit our brokenness. Can you even admit that? No, I am something. I am not nothing. Can you admit your brokenness and abandon that false idea and notion that somehow we can be good enough? God, look at what I've done. You owe me. Instead, what Christ is calling us to do is cast ourselves at the mercy of Jesus' feet. We are broken. But before I conclude this sermon, I want to, I think this is appropriate, I want to connect this message with something else, okay? Now, as you know, when I was appointed senior pastor, I was the only elder here at GHC. But the hope and the aim of GHC was always to have a plurality, meaning more than one, of elders. So men who would walk and shepherd the church alongside me and alongside with me. Now, finding qualified men is never easy, It's not because there aren't qualified men per se, but because this is a spiritual calling. This is a spiritual calling from the Lord and one that the church should confirm. Now, I knew when the Lord called me into ministry, there's that both external but also internal pulling from the Lord, which was then confirmed by the external, the church, saying, yes, I agree, I confirm and affirm that appointing and anointing, but also that internal Uh, calling was also confirmed too. And the calling the ministry gave me, uh, it gave me a confidence, that calling, because even in the midst of difficult circumstances, I knew again, it wasn't just the church or the people or my emotions, but it was the Lord and his word that called me. Now, whether it's a church split or a global pandemic, it's never easy. But the thing is, my confidence is not in myself, but it's in knowing the heart that God has given me for the church that will allow me to serve and shepherd you all through the ups and downs of church life. And so what I want to do is this. I want to explain just a little bit. What is an elder? An elder is a man who meets the qualifications found in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Elder's primary job is to preach and teach the word of the Lord and to pray over his sheep and to oversee the affairs of the church. But there's one particular word found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. It says this that they need to exercise oversight. 
Oversight means that they need to watch over the flock. They need to be instructing the sheep and strengthening the ones that are weak and guiding and guarding the ones that are vulnerable and rebuking even the ones that are stubborn and even bearing alongside the ones that are difficult. They're called to do this because they're called and they know, know that one day they'll stand before the Lord and they'll have to give an account where God will say, how did you shepherd my sheep? So why more than one elder? Now, I don't know if you realize this, but in this past year and a half or past two years perhaps, there's been an onslaught of pastors resigning or getting fired for all sorts of disqualifying reasons. If you've re read Christian news or even secular news, there's been mentioning of all these things, and I'm not going to go into it, but all these things range for disqualifying reasons like adultery to abuse of power to mismanagement of finances, and the list goes on and on. And so one of the main reasons for a plurality of elders is for biblical accountability. Pastors are elders, and elders are pastors, but guess what? They're also men. And as elders, they need to live life above reproach, which means that they are called to live in such a way that does not, mean, does, does not bring disgrace upon the church body, nor does it bring disgrace or shame upon the name of Jesus. And so to ensure this, it requires accountability where elders share their lives with each other, speak truth, and yes, many times, elders have to even rebuke one another if you're going off. But also, having more than one elder, it allows for more wisdom to be found in making important decisions. And it creates a balance within the leadership because the days of the senior pastor has to do everything is long gone. Hallelujah. There's a funny illustration of a pastor's job description. It says, we are looking for a pastor, and the ideal pastor preaches exactly 20 minutes. He condemns sin, but never hurts anyone's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. to midnight and also serves as the church janitor. He makes $40 a week, wears good clothes, and donates $30 a week to the church. He is 29 years old with 40 years of experience. He is both tall and short, thin and heavy set, and has one brown eye and one blue eye. He makes 15 house calls a day and is always in his office. Having a plurality of elders is also burden sharing because caring for the church was never intended for one person to bear alone. There is brokenness all around us like we've just heard in this passage. And according to scripture, there are men that we know in this church who the Lord has been raising up to help comfort and love on and shepherd those who are in need. Those who are confused, those who are hurting, and those who are rebellious, and those who are alone. Now, while I remain still as your senior pastor... I'll tell you right now, there is a world of faithfulness and giftedness and godliness from men here who will help the church, GHC, grow towards a newer and brighter future. You believe that? Say amen. amen. That means that while I've been praying steadily for the past three years about the eldership selection, we will, according to our church constitution and bylaws, begin the process by selecting covenant members to be part of this elder selection committee. These individuals will have been a member of GHC for at least two years, and they must be in good standing, meaning that they're plugged in, that they're serving, that they're consistently attending Sunday service, that they're faithful givers. They don't have a history of gossip or drama or so forth because there will be important information and discussions that, will, that, that, will, uh, that they'll have and this committee will have a minimum of five members and no more than seven. Now, we'll send an email detailing all these other things for you guys later, but know this. November 7th, aka next week, our covenant members will receive a form. A form much like how you guys receive the deacon form for nomination. And you will have until the next Sunday, the 14th, to cast your forms in with your submission of a, of a nominee for the selection committee. Again, this is not for the elders. This is to find a committee to help in the elder selection. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but we should be praying for men and women who have exercised a deep commitment to knowing the people of GHC and who demonstrate a life of wisdom, prayerfulness, and thoughtfulness. 
and the deacons and the pastoral staff, we will be working alongside the committee. Folks, a lot has happened these past two years in particular. The Lord clearly calls us to keep pressing on, and we will keep moving forward. That means that we must have now and pursue the selection of elders. Why? Because there's so much work to be done. There's still so many people who need to be shepherded and so many people who need prayer and so many people who need to be loved. The broken are all out there, but the broken are also still within here. While we as the people and leaders of the church, we may falter, brothers and sisters, our hope is this, and our understanding is that Jesus, our chief shepherd, will never fail us because he's all about loving the broken and he loves the nobodies because he's in the business of redeeming, restoring, and reclaiming the fallen people and separated. Let's all pursue the revealed will of God. He's given us a prescription. He's saying, this is how I want you to lead the church. And trust me, God is saying, I will work through you. He will work through us. We will trust in his holy word. We will be empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will guide us through it all towards a new future. Amen? Amen. Bow with me.